is to get you guys interested in research as well. Um, so, and everything else ties into research, so I'm going to be talking about how you can get involved, the different competitions you should be doing, um, maybe if you're a younger student, like you're a middle school student or you're just a freshman, what are the first steps you can take to get involved, um, how to come up with a topic, and by topic I mean for every research presentation or research project you do, you have like a central topic that you're researching around. Um, and there's so many different possible topics in so many different fields like biology, chemistry, math, computer science. So how do you find that topic that's right for you? 
um, I'll be talking about finding a research mentor, which is extremely crucial because your research mentor is the person who kind of guides you and um, provides a lot of mentorship because science research is a very specific and technical sort of field, and they're the ones who, um, if you have a good research mentor, it's, they're very instrumental to your success. Um, I'll also be going over some more specifics about the scientific method and designing your experiments. Um, and finally, I'll be going over the science fairs and competitions that are available that um, it would be a good idea to enter in. And part two of my presentation is more a general advice session about my own high school experience. Um, so I'm gonna, I know like a lot of you guys, I got a lot of questions like what advice do you have for like a shy freshman or a shy middle school student? Um, actually, I was one of them uh, four years ago. So I'll be going over how I changed from a shy girl to like a well-refined public speaker and leader. Um, I'll be also talking about how I got the positions and opportunities that I did, not just how they were valuable, but how you guys can get these opportunities as well. Um, I'll be going over extracurriculars and time management because you know everyone only has 24 hours, but how do you maximize that? How do you become more productive with your time? Um, leadership um, and my own sort of personal reflection, some of the quotes I like, the sky's the limit, and um, just like my reflection on my high school experience. Okay, so I'm going to begin with my own science background, and I'll start off with a story of how I got interested in science. Um, so I'm an only child, and um, so my parents are immigrants as well, and I guess in general, in the beginning, we were pretty clueless about the whole process of college applications. So if you feel the same way, and you're like, your first child is going through high school, um, we're in the same boat, so don't worry. I'm just going to give you guys some more advice to help you guys um, get through the process. But when I was a freshman, um, or actually going back, um, when I was growing up, I was the only child, like I said, but I had two cats, and one of them was Sassy, which was a girl, and one of them was Sam, which is a boy cat. And Sam had, he was like this black cat, which had, he had like a completely black fur coat, while Sassy was like multicolored and she had different spots on her fur. And I was just wondering, like, when I was small, how is it, why is it that Sassy had spots, but Sam doesn't? Um, and I never really got to answer that until later on. And what happened in freshman year biology, we were learning about this topic called X chromosome inactivation. And this is basically where it only occurs in females, where one of the X chromosomes is turned off during embryonic development, it's deactivated. So um, at first, when I was just learning about this topic, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna memorize it for my test. And then, but later when I was like, you know, napping with my cats and playing with them, I realized that this explained everything because the reason why Sassy had spots was because in different, she was a girl, and in different parts of her fur, a different X chromosome was turned on or off, causing different alleles to be expressed, and that's why she had this, you know, multicolored fur coat. And that was a moment when I kind of like solved my whole childhood conundrum, if you will. Um, that it was like really cool because I found out that you know something that I learned in school, something so average in an ancient biology textbook actually explain something that I was wondering um, for almost my entire life. And even though that's like a really small instance, it wasn't like I like discovered, or it was kind of like, it was like really small and no one else would care except for me, but it sparked my interest in science and biology in general. Um, and I used that story, or that story kind of inspired me to like go through the rest of my path. And what happened was in the sophomore of my summer year, I did this program called Project Smart. Um, like, of course you don't have to write this down because I'll be talking more about summer programs that might be better fitted for you later on. But this is just what I did. Um, so SMART stands for Science and Mathematics Achievement Through Research Training at the University of New Hampshire. And this program, it wasn't like research, it was more like um, a four-week science camp where I got to you know, meet new people and go through different science and biotechnology, nanotechnology classes, uh, labs, discussions about like the ethics of different treatments like stem cell research and stuff like that. But there wasn't like any individual research involved. And then at the end of that institute, basically we um, made a poster about like a current event research that's going on and we presented it to all the professors there. 
And that's actually what I would recommend. I know like a lot of students who are interested in research want to dive right in and go work at a lab or like get their own research project right away. But I feel like um, I would recommend doing a more like a Cosmo sort of program where you get a get exposed to the fun aspect of science because research is very individual. It's kind of um, an isolated experience where it's at times very frustrating and very difficult. And I feel like if you're first exposed to that environment, um, you're gonna get scared away by science. But it's actually a very fun process. And if you go through like a more um, interactive camp, I think it's a great way to develop your child's interest in science. Um, so after that, in my junior year, I started shadowing a graduate student at Stanford, one of the um, labs, the Genome Technology Center. And um, again, this wasn't an individual research project that I did. I helped and assisted my graduate student with her research. And at the time, I felt um, I felt like I was wasn't like maximizing my potential because I wanted to like answer my own questions instead of being like a lab assistant and helping like wash materials sometimes um, and doing what she wanted me to do. But looking back, I also think this was an important stage in my growing experience because that's where I learned all the lab techniques. And like without that, I couldn't have started my own project in the future. Like. Um, my last bullet point like you need that transition process where you have to become acclimated to the lab experience and learn what I guess mentors want from you so you can apply that later on when you're doing your own project um, and so that like I mentioned my last bullet point was this summer when I was a research intern at Stanford at Stanford School of Medicine, and um, that's where I did my project that I later on entered in the Siemens and Intel STS competition. Um, and I kind of just like put everything that I gained along the way into this final experience. And um, like I, I kind of like leveraged everything I learned um, from the Science Institute to like mentoring my graduate student at her lab into here. And I think that's the reason why um, I got accepted into this lab and also um, why I was able to be successful. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So how do you make the initial contact with the graduate students and uh, you know how do you convince her to take you? Mm -hmm. because, yeah. I mean, you know, they're also busy. So. Right, right. I actually will be talking about that more later on. Uh -huh. So um, if if at the end of that um, you still am curious or you feel like my question hasn't been answered or your question hasn't been answered, I can talk about it more, but I will be covering that. Okay, um, so more about how you can get involved. Um, so so um, for the younger students in this classroom, like middle school students or freshmen or sophomores, um, I know like there's an age limit where like, you have to be 16 to work in a research university. Um, so what I would recommend for you guys is to start by just broadening your scientific knowledge. I think that's super important because um, whether that's like reading science magazines or watching science documentaries, you need to be exposed to like the science that's going on, going around you so you can get ideas or um, you have to get into that mindset of being curious and wondering about questions. And I think that some resources that I would rec really recommend are science magazines like Popular Science and Science Daily. Um, both of these magazines kind of give you like the current events of like everything related to science or technology. Um, and I think it's it's kind of different from like professional journals because like how many of you guys have heard of like Nature or Cell? <laughs> yeah, so only Okay, um so like there's like two people out of this entire room that raised their hands and the reason for that is because they're very like um, technical and they contain a lot of technical and scientific jargon and it's not very fun to read on a leisurely basis while these magazines they're very interesting like um, they have topics that are all more applicable to your life and so that's why I would recommend these and for younger students science news for kids is also a great resource um, my personal favorite is Nova and how you guys have heard of PBS yeah, so more people, right? And it's um, Nova. It's like they say it's for it's, it's a show for curious people wanting to learn more things or something like that. Um, it basically just has like these short documentaries and long documentaries. Um, if you're like uh, if you have a short attention span, you can go for the shorter documentaries. But they um, explain like really um, I guess day to day occurrences that you might not think of. For example, like they have one like 
how come pigeons are able to like find their way home like thousands of miles away? Like how come they have a built-in GPS system? Or why is it that spin storms spin? Or what's the relationship between um, like memory and intelligence? It's very like interesting hands-on topics that really broaden your science knowledge. Um, and so I think that's like a more long-term thing. It doesn't happen overnight. So I just recommend you guys um, like encourage your children or if you're a high school student or a middle school student to look more into that. Um, something else that I never did, but I know a lot of people who place very well in science competitions did, is um, the Small Science Workshop in San Jose. I'm not sure, it's not, I don't think it's too well known, but um, basically they have this program called the Advanced Science Research Program for high school students, and I think um, maybe eighth, grade, eighth graders. Um, and what happens is you pay them, and they place you in a lab, and they give you a mentor, and I think they recommend you a project. And you work in the lab, you gain lab experience, and you can enter that into competitions. So if you're, I know it's like pretty hard to go out by yourself to find your own research mentor in Stanford because um, like there are very busy people and usually they wouldn't accept high school students. So this one is a great way to get yourself um, into the water and start like trying your own research. The only caveat is you have to pay, but I think um, based off of what I've heard from other people who did it um, and who are very successful in science, it has been like a stepping stone for their future success. So I guess I, I would rec like, I recommend you to look into that, although I can't speak personally about it. Um, and then finally, um, like the summer programs I was talking about, I did one called Project Smart, like I mentioned, but um, definitely there are a lot more out there that you can look into. For example, Cosmos is super popular. Um, there's also a lot of university-sponsored programs like Simmer, YFP, um, these other acronyms, I, I can let you copy it down, but um, Simmer and uh, RSI are both very competitive. Um, YSP, HS, HSP are both um, more moderate level difficulty ones. Um, so if you apply, I would recommend like applying to more than one for sure, like apply to three or four, um, so you have some backup. And, and also a resource that I really found useful was the link that I provided here. And the reason why is because, like I come from Limbrook, and I know some of you guys are from Limbrook as well, or Monta Vista, or um, Saratoga, and as a public school, like they provide you a lot of, like, a decent amount of resources on the college and career center, but it really is nothing compared to private schools. And I went up, actually looked online, and um, like the top science or technology school is like this private school called Thomas and Jefferson Science and Technology. So what I did was I went on their website and I looked at the resources they had. And um, I, I won't show you because you can just go home and look at yourself, but they basically have over three to 400 science or math or, um, it's not necessarily STEM, but there's also like, I think more humanities related summer programs that you can look into. And um, I found this super helpful because when I just did a research, like a Google search, it was very scattered. I didn't know, like maybe there was an age requirement. It was like only 11th graders and up, or maybe the deadline already passed, or maybe it was too expensive. So it was just very like frustrating and time consuming, but this um, link provides you like with a table with like you know the deadline, the cost, the um, competitiveness, and you know the requirements all listed on there. So it's a very easy search for you to use if you're interested in finding a proper or a science program or a summer program that suits you. Okay, um, in terms of coming up with a topic. Sorry. Okay. In terms of coming up with a topic, I think um, there's several things you can do. Um, definitely, other other high school students' projects can serve as really good inspiration for you. Um, I think it's useful to look at the abstracts of other other high school students' science projects. Um, and the abstracts, if you don't know, are basically it's like a one-page summary of all the research that they did, including the hypothesis, um, their experimental design, and their um, final results. And so actually there's something called the synopsis science fair that's coming up on March 12th. And I've known like students who actually go there and, um, are you doing it? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, so I know students who actually go there and um, they like basically ask, they go to each booth and they ask them for their abstract papers like so they can take home and by the end of the day they have like a stack that they kind of hoard to themselves and look at at home as inspiration. And I think that's like a general good idea for you guys to do as well. Um, so again, it's on March 12th. Um, I think I'll be there as well. 
Um, and something else is just to join STEM-related clubs in your high school. Um, so at Limbrook, I know there's a science club, there's a woman in STEM club, there's a math club, computer science club, there's a lot. So um, I think these are generally good for you to gain exposure to things um, because I know science club, every week they do like either a lab experiment or a presentation about a cool science topic. So again, these are good for inspiration um, to help your mind think of a good science project for you. Um, something else is discussion with teachers, mentors, peers. Um, part of the reason why I chose or I eventually entered in like the Siemens and Intel competition was um, because of my friends or one of my friends who did it last year. And so like I always see like I always thought Siemens and Intel was like a very it is a very prestigious program and when I was like a sophomore or junior I never even thought about entering it because I thought it was like oh, it's for like really, really smart people, I can't do it. Um, but the reason why I ended up doing it is because my friend, um, one of my close friends, entered the competition and then I kind of realized, you know, like it's, it's actually open to everyone. And so I think it's really cool to, it's a really good idea to discuss with other people, upperclassmen, and to have mentors to talk about it with. Um, if you go to Limbrook, Miss Alonzo is a great resource um, because she was my mentor and she really, like she's really supportive of every high school student's um, I guess passion or like inspiration to do science. So talk to your teachers for sure. I think in general they should be pretty supportive of your endeavors. Um, another website is sciencebuddies.org. It's um, it's more for students who it's like their first and second time doing a science fair, and it's, um, it basically provides a lot of different ideas for inspiration again on what sort of science projects you can do, and it's very organized. Um, maybe if I can go to their website. Okay, yeah, so it looks like this, and basically if you look at all the tabs, they have different things that you can click on. Um, so under project ideas, if you go into that, it lists out every project in different categories. So if you're interested in engineering versus life science or earth environmental science, um, you can find one that suits you and then click on the sublink, and it basically has a list of all the different projects um, from previous years that you can get ideas from. I wouldn't recommend taking it, but maybe like if you can build off of it, combine ideas, come up with your own topic. Um, and they have different uh, difficulty levels as well. So they have like the easy, medium, difficult. If, you, if you're a first time or if you're a more advanced science student, you can choose accordingly. Okay, and finally, like um, just examine your own life because I think science projects in general are more um, impressive or not necessarily impressive, but they relate to people more if it's something to do with your own life. Like maybe if you have a relative who is affected by a disease um, or maybe, I think, um, I'm not sure if you've heard, but I have a friend in Cupertino who like he got rich because he designed this application where instead of reading the news, um, he, the app would come up with a summary of it so you don't have to read the entire news article. I don't know if you have, has anyone heard of that app? No, okay, well it was in the news and he, I think like Yahoo bought off the app from him and he got like millions of dollars, but um, it was because he was trying to do a history research paper and he didn't want to read like all the news articles and he thought it was a pain, so he ended up designing an app, which I personally think took much more time to, but, to do it, but he got rich. Um, so um, <laughs> that app he designed to summarize all the news articles and basically it's like instead of taking like 10 minutes to read a news article, it took like one minute. Um, so that was like something personal that he designed because he wanted to benefit himself. But if you want, like you could think about like your other relatives, if you know like if they have any diseases that you might be interested in. Personally, I know my friend, my close friend of mine, she, her mom had breast cancer, so that was um, an inspiration for me to do my project. Um, I'll be talking more about that later, but it relates to breast cancer. Okay. Um, so here's my general like philosophy behind research. I think it's really important um, to kind of share this with you guys before you get into research. Um, first of all, I would really recommend you to start with your own idea. Um, like the everything I referenced before, like science buddies, etc., is a source of inspiration. But I definitely wouldn't recommend you to take an idea straight from that. And like I know I have a lot of ideas and I'd love to share them with you guys, but I don't want to because I think um, it's really important for you to come up with your own idea. Um, research is kind of, it's a 
long and difficult process and I feel like if you're not like 100% passionate about your topic and you're not like truly interested in discovering why, you won't get through it. And I think it actually harms you if I tell you a topic and give it to you because part of the process of science research is um, like coming up, like learning how to ask the right questions um, because that's going to be necessary while you're doing the project. If you reach a dead end, you have to find out what other questions, what other ways can I do to approach it. So definitely start off with your own idea. Um, number two, it's never too late to get involved. I know this is not exactly applicable to you guys since there's not many, there's no juniors or seniors in this room. Most, most of you guys are pretty young. Um, but for me, I got started with science research pretty late. Um, I started in my junior year while a lot of my peers started in middle school or in like ninth and 10th grade. And it was actually um, my mentor, Ms. Alonzo, who encouraged me to get started with science research. And um, I feel like if you are really dedicated and you put in the time um, to do your own research at home, like even if you leave the lab, you go home and you still immerse yourself in the background literature and read more about it, um, you can like get caught up. And it's, it's just, it's not too late to get involved. Um, of course, since you guys are all younger students, you guys have the benefit of getting more experience and starting earlier, which is great. And it'll just benefit you guys even more. Um, number three, don't do research for the sake of competitions. Um, I know this is like a more idealized sort of philosophy, but like my dad used to tell me, like if you just imagine a cart and a horse, um, which one pulls the other one? So does the horse pull the cart or does the cart pull the horse? The horse pulls the, the horse. Cart. Thank you. Okay, yeah. so the horse is in the front. So I feel like when you do research, you go in the mindset of you doing research for the sake of you know satisfying your own curiosity or discovering knowledge for the benefit of society. You don't go to do research for the sake of winning a competition because research in itself is very valuable. Personally, I feel like research has been um, the one of the or like at least one of the most valuable things I've done in high school. Um, other than like just academic work, research has been really valuable for me. And I think competitions in general are prone to like randomization and it's kind of like um, competitions are pretty unpredictable. But um, if you go in the mindset of doing research for the sake of satisfying your own curiosity, um, I think you'll get a lot more out of it. Um, number four, it's not what you do, but how you do it. And what I mean by this is, um, like to be honest, like how most of the high school students, I'm speaking like as a generalization, but most high school students aren't going to find the next cure for breast cancer or some like super applicable topic that will change the world. Um, because like research is very specific and oftentimes what you find and like the application of it, there's still a long road ahead. And that's true of my research as well. There's, um, it's definitely not at all at the stage of applying it to benefit society yet. Um, but um, I think it's the whole process of research is not really about like the results, but it's how you do it and the way that you present it more to that really appeals to judges. Um, so for example, like my research, it was, um, I guess I'll just talk about it now, but I found the, a particular gene called P21 that plays a role in regulating the self renewal of stem cells. And to give you more context of that, um, one of the reasons why there isn't like a lasting cure for breast cancer is because um, like there's certain things called cancer stem cells and they're able to remain in the state of dormancy or inactivity that allows them to hide from current treatments like chemotherapy and other targeted treatments. So my project tries to find a way around this through understanding what controls um, the dormant stage in these cancer stem cells. So like I said, I identified this gene that plays a role in regulating that state, that link between dormancy and self-renewal. Um, but that itself is like not yet applicable to anything. It's just the discovery of knowledge. Um, but I feel like the reason why my research was successful was how I designed the experiments. Um, like the proper controls that I used, the questions that I asked, um, because I think just personally what judges are looking for if you're interested in um, entering in competition is um, your demonstration of the scientific method, which I'll be talking about more, but um, like your demonstration of the scientific method in the, in the sense that like your experiments, everything you design leads up to your conclusion. Like what you conclude is, no, is because of your hypothesis and not something else. 
And I guess to, to give you guys a more practical example of that, like say you wake up in the morning, right? And then you see rain outside. I mean, not rain, you see water outside on the ground. Um, and like one thing that you might hypothesize is, oh, it rained last night, that's why the ground is wet. And then if you just conclude, oh, um, it's because it rained yesterday that the ground is wet, I'm done with my like sort of quote unquote project, that's wrong. Because like what about, what if like the sprinklers were on? Or what if someone just spilled, do it on your own in a science classroom? But once you get to more advanced, I think it's necessary to find a research mentor. And I have three ways that you can do it. Um, so number one, um, like I mentioned at the synopsis science fair, that's usually like the first stage um, where people interested in science can get involved. And this is like a county-wide science fair where there's like a thousand different people from various schools and at the science fair there's, they have judges. And the judges are, they invite like maybe postdocs from Stanford or UCSF, um, professors, they also have um, more corporate people like um, some marketing person from Amgen Technologies or other biotechnology companies, but they're all related to STEM in some shape or form. So it's really good for you at these competitions to network with the judges um, since they're already there. And not just network with the ones who come to your booth, but also go out and talk with them. Get their contact information, talk about like your passion in your project and how you might contribute to their company or their lab. Um, and I think, like honestly, the best way to network with people is obviously in person. I mean, you can contact them through email, but the chances that they're likely to respond to that is much lower. So take advantage of the synopsis science fair and really network with judges. Um, something else that you should take advantage of is job shadow at your school. So how many of you guys have job shadow or have heard of it? Okay, I know Limbrick has it for sure, but um, I, I'm fairly positive other schools have it, and basically how it works is it's like a program where um, they, the school has different um, people who, like, pe like I guess, uh, business people or um, research mentors or basically people who are able to take in students as hosts and allow them to shadow their work for one day. And our school is pretty, they have a lot of different resources, like they, have, they invite um, research uh, professors at Stanford or they invite like chefs at different restaurants or um, a business CEO of a marketing firm and basically all of these are in the real world they're professors they're professional and if you take advantage of job shadow at your school um, like for example they have ones at Stanford FP3 Diamond Technologies NASA Ames um, if you take advantage of that and go there and really network with the people who are in charge of that job shadow, um, then it's also a lot easier to find research mentors there. I know people who have been to Stanford and they've shadowed someone for one day and during that experience they were also able to talk with other professionals in that environment and they eventually got an internship there. So really take advantage of that. Um, um, oh, and one more thing is like for you guys who are freshmen and sophomores, um, it's harder for you guys to take advantage of that because they give priorities to juniors and seniors and usually the juniors are the ones who take all these like brand name companies. So something I would recommend is if you're a freshman or a sophomore, have your parent be a job shadow host because if like most of your parents work at companies and if you guys host someone then you get number one priority in choosing other companies to shadow. And the third thing is individually contacting professors. And I think that this one is probably the most difficult because it's like cold emailing or cold calling these really busy professors. And if you think about it, they have like a graduate degree, they have PhD, and they're super smart and intelligent. Why would they accept someone who hasn't even gone to college? Um, so I think the, the, there's two reasons for that. One is um, they, 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 out of their kindness of their hearts, they kind of want to help and shadow a high school student to help them become like a better scientist or a future research scientist. Um, and number two is if you really demonstrate your passion and they're kind of touched by like how much you like science and they'll accept you by that. Um, so first, how I would recommend going about this is first you want to um, like I said, come up with your own research topic. Like, 
professors like it when you have demonstrated a track record of your science um, through doing your own project at Synopsys or um, other smaller science competitions. So after you have done that, then based off of your project, I would go look online. They have all the professor emails online if you do a quick Google search like Stanford Department of Chemistry professors. Um, if, you're, if your project is related to chemistry, then it's really easy to leverage your experience to how you can contribute to that lab. Um, and I'll show you an example email later, but basically you can reference um, what you did in your project by yourself and how that shows your interest in science and how you can contribute to that lab. Um, so number two, I talked about looking at departments online. Um, and number three, this does take a bit of time, but I think it's worth it. So what they also online, they have kind of an abstract of the professor's project, like what is involved with it, what sort of technologies are they using. Um, and it's, it's kind of hard to read because research is very specific, but if you take the time and kind of like understand their project and reference specific parts of their project in the email, it'll make it a lot more convincing and appealing for the professor. Okay, so um, like I said before, um, emailing professors is hard, but um, I've actually had a lot of my like lower classmen friends like ask me like for advice on doing it, and like I told them like some of the tips that I'll be talking about now, um, and actually they were pretty successful. I was really surprised, but um, two people I've helped already have established contacts at Stanford, um, and they're going to go in for interviews soon. Um, so like I said, the two things that I would really recommend you doing is referencing a specific aspect of their project and what ideas you have. Um, because like as a intern, they want you to help them, right? So they want to see that you're interested in what they're doing and what you can contribute. And um, even though like you're a high school student, I would I would still recommend going for it. But in your email, don't be pretentious. Don't say like, oh, I've, I'm really smart at my school. I'm top in the class. Because as smart as you are, you're still nothing really compared to them who have had years of experience. So don't be afraid to admit that. In my email, I was like, I'm sorry. I'm only a high school student. Um, I'm probably like much, uh, I don't have as much experience as the undergraduates and graduates working at your lab. But I can make that up with my passion for your, what you're doing. Um, and also provide your background in science. And number one, make it personal. So the girl that I advised to get like an internship just a few weeks ago, um, what she did was she wanted to do um, work in a stem cell biology lab like I did, and she referenced something really personal. She talked about her chemistry teacher. Um, so our chemistry teacher at school is currently, um, he's diagnosed with lymphoma, I believe, so he is currently out of school. And she talked about how um, this teacher, Dr. Rockland, he was diagnosed with lymphoma and he spoke frequently about his treatments and one of them included like a stem cell treatment and that's why she was interested in this field. So if you make it personal and really relate to something that is tangible and like personal, then I think it'll be a lot more convincing. Versus if you say cliche phrases like, I'm super passionate about science, I'm top in my class, it's not that, like you can see the difference. Okay, so I have put an email here and I purposely made the font really small because I don't want, I don't recommend you copying it because it's different for every professor and every lab anyways, but I just decided to highlight some things um, that I thought were important. So um, like before I did my research internship at Stanford this summer, like I mentioned, I shadowed a graduate student um, at another lab in Stanford before. Um, so I feel like research is pretty interrelated, at least in one field. So I reference specific things that I did or I helped my graduate student with with her research and I talked about how I might want to apply that to their lab um, because their lab was doing something with circulating tumor cells and even though the project that I did with my graduate student wasn't related to that at all I was able to kind of tie those two things in because um, like they're they're in a sense related in the sense that they're both like biology or using imaging to um, detect a certain uh, behavior in cells. So by relating it together, um, it was more impressive. And like I said, um, you don't want to make this email long. Like even though you've done a project before, the professor isn't as interested as that as what you can contribute to your lab. So I wrote, I would love to talk more about pro my project, but I'm more interested in what your lab does, and I talk more about that. And what ended up happening with this email was he forwarded it to um, another professor. And even though that professor was like very against 
students doing summer research. What he wrote in that email was like, um, Dr. whatever is not really interested in taking students in the summer because she feels like it's too short to actually do something, but your email was so compelling I had to forward it to her. So if you write a really good email, it definitely counts and it makes you stand out. Um, and back to that email, if you have like more specific questions, like you can feel free to talk to me after my presentation and I can give you more insight on that. Okay, um, so I was talking about the scientific method before that. Um, this is really what I believe judges are looking for that you demonstrate in your project. Because if you think about it, like a lot of successful research um, is less, it's like, you have to be kind of lucky to get results that actually work, and that luck shouldn't play a factor in how the judges decide how good your project is. Instead, it's how you demonstrate the scientific method. Um, and I'll just walk you through the process really quickly and tie it back to how um, I did my research. Um, so number one, when I did my research this summer at Stanford, um, the first thing you want to do is ask questions and address problems. So when I went in, my professor, he presented me a lot of data and um, that showed that this specific transcription factor called BCL11B plays a role in regulating the self-renewal of stem cells. And I thought that was really cool, but um, at the same time, I was curious, like, how exactly does this transcription factor regulate um, the self-renewal? And what does regulate mean? That's very vague. Does it mean, like, it represses the proliferation, or it increases it? Or, like, regulation is just a very vague term in general. So I was curious, like, what I could do to solve that problem and understand, understand the underlying molecular mechanisms behind which this particular transcription factor regulates the self-renewal. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions. Like, don't be that shy girl or guy who goes into a lab and just says yes to everything the professor tells you to, um, and like be meek and just like go along with, you know, like maybe doing some pipetting for the professor or um, just washing materials. Um, you can also like ask questions because they want you to contribute to the lab. Um, so number two, it's really important for you to do background research, especially for me because I was in the game pretty late. Um, so I, yeah, like I said, you can make that up because for me, I didn't really actually leave the lab in the sense that I left like in the evening, but even at home, I was doing research about like the background literature online. Um, so I could go in every day with a more um, like well-informed background. Um, number three, like all this hypothesis, procedure, method, experiment, um, collect data, analyze data, and results, I guess I won't go into that too much because it's specific for every project that you do. Um, but I really like to emphasize that when you're designing your experiment, it's really important to have control. Um, and to go back to my, my example of like the instance where you see water on the ground and you don't know if it's rain or it's sprinklers or someone spilled water, um, there's so many confounding variables that might contribute to your results um, that you don't know about. So you have to make sure to design controls to control for each and every one to make sure that it's like this result or this cause that results in this result. Um, and I know it's like, it's hard to design controls um, at this time, but I think I can also help you guys with that if you have a specific project that you want to do and you don't know um, like how to design it to account for different confounding variables, I can talk to you more specifically about that later. Um, and this is a useful tool that my teacher, or my research teacher at school recommended all students to use. Um, so if you want to like, like copy it down, but it's also also available on Google. Um, it's just like a roadmap of your experiment because you don't want to go in um, like with just a vague question and you don't really know what you're doing. You want to have everything planned out, like all your independent variables, your dependent variable, um, the things that you're keeping constant, and your control. So you can control for um, the different external factors that might affect your experiment. But again, this is specific. Um, so I feel like um, your time and my time can be best used giving you guys more advice on stuff. So the specific factors that you can probably find online as well, um, I'll let you find online. Okay, and now going into science fairs. Um, so I guess uh, there's a lot of them out there, but this is a general pathway that people take 
everyone kind of starts with Synopsis, which is a county-wide science fair. Um, it's open to everyone. Anyone who's interested in science can enter this competition. Um, those who do well, I believe, first place, um, advance to the California State Fair, and those who do well in that advance to the Intel Science and Engineering Fair, which is like a national competition. Um, and those who do that usually are pretty advanced in their science research, and they're more um, 11th or 12th graders who make that competition. Um, so the general timeline for synopsis, if you're interested, um, this year it's too late because the deadline has already passed. But in terms of next year, um, you should start pretty early in August through September. That's when you should be brainstorming research topics and ideas. Um, maybe if you want to do more advanced research that, uh, that requires more advanced technology to find a mentor um, or a lab. Um, in October to November, you have to write your proposal, which is what you have to submit um, to get your project approved. Um, December to March, or even earlier, you start your research, and March 11th through 12th, you present your project in front of judges. Okay, so I have a question for you guys. Um, what is some of the things that you should be doing at Synopsis? Um, other than presenting your research project. I mentioned this before. I know some of you guys are pretty tired. It's kind of stuffy in here. So I want to make sure you guys have been listening and remembering what I have been, what I've been saying. So does anyone remember what sort of things you should be doing at Synopsis? Yeah. Asking for abstracts. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's one thing. Um, one, there's another thing that I talked about. No one? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I saw a hand. Yeah, so network with judges and make sure, um, because this is a really good opportunity, it's like a platform for you to go higher and find a research mentor. So um, good, good job, guys. Remember what I have been saying. Um, and more like other science competitions, um, Siemens is the one that I did this year. It's mostly, it's open to seniors if you're doing an individual project, but um, if you want to start earlier, what you can do is pair up with a senior because it's open to teams as well. So there just has to be at least one senior. And then um, even if you're a freshman and you find a senior who's willing to do it with you, you can enter in as a team. And this one is different from other like synopsis science fairs because it requires less of a public speaking ability. It's more of the research report, which I find to be harder because um, this research report resembles um, advanced journals like Nature or Cell or PNAS that require a different writing ability than like what you would normally do in class. Um, and the best way that I would advise you to do this, if you're interested, is uh, read example papers like Nature. Um, these are the top science journals in the world, and that's the way that you can model your own research based off of that. Um, and that's how I did it. I didn't take, like, there's no class you can take for writing research papers, or there probably is, but, like, I don't think it's necessary. You can just um, learn yourself by modeling other advanced research papers. Um, so the application is due the end of September. Um, this one is, the competition is strictly based off of your science project, not looking at a holistic view of who you are as a person or like a contributor in science. It's just looking at your, um, the meat, the project. Um, and they select semifinalists as well as regional finalists that advance to national finalists. And I was selected as a semifinalist. So I didn't have, I didn't get to compete further on for this competition. Um, in terms of Intel, uh, sorry that bit is cut off, but um, I'm pretty sure most of you guys have heard of it. They, they say on the website that it's the nation's most prestigious science research competition for high school seniors. Um, and this one is only open to seniors. There's, and it's only an individual project, so you can't do it with a team. Um, and this one is more extensive, the application process. It not only includes that research paper for Siemens, but they look at you as a whole. They look at your extracurricular activities, your leadership. They have a bunch of essay questions that require you to apply your project to a larger scale. Like, for example, um, one of them was like, uh, how do you see your research benefiting the world? Or like, what major science questions you want to tackle in the next 20 years? Um, what do you want to do in the future, et cetera. Um, so it's a more holistic view. They require essays, recommendation letters, transcripts, activities. It's a pretty hefty application. Um, it's like three, I would say like almost three college applications combined because they ask for a lot of material. Um, and the application is due in mid-November. So I would definitely recommend you to get started earlier with this. Um, the way I would 
like recommend you to go about this is do both, both Siemens and Intel if you can. Because Siemens is you do your research paper first and you get all of that done. And by the time Intel deadline comes around, because it's about a month later, you already have kind of the hardest part of it done and you can focus on your essay questions, um, your activities um, and other things like that. Because if you try to do it all at once, it's honestly too much and it's very, it's kind of stressful. So try to do both and you can balance your workload. Um, so, like I said, uh, they select 30 semi-finalists and 40 finalists. I was fortunate enough to be named as a finalist, so I'll be competing at Washington, D.C. next month. Does anyone have any questions about these two competitions? Okay. So, uh, one question. How important is the essay? How important is the essay? Is it your competition? I think... Um, in other words, uh, the writing skills. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I remember when I did my essay, and like it's really important to have people read it. So I asked my uh, Miss Alonzo, who was like my research mentor at school, um, to read over it. And at first, she was like, "Oh, you're you're being your voice is kind of soft because you're trying to be too humble or modest in your application." Um, so definitely, I think in these essays, are it's like a place for you to brag about yourself. Um, in terms of how much it accounts for like the actual competition, um, I would say like I, I don't know, but based off of what my teacher has told me, like about thirty percent, um, because. They, again, they're looking for like a holistic view of yourself, um, but like, I think like besides essays, maybe like your own leadership activities, extracurriculars also account for 10% and 60% is the actual research project and the, um, the report. Okay. Um, so this is like general advice about how to write a good research paper. Um, so first, read scientific literature often. I think that for me was the most important part in writing a science research paper. Um, when I asked my Miss Alonzo at my school to read it, she was like, wow, this is really good. You have like a natural scientific writing ability. Um, I don't think that was true. I think it's because I just had a lot of exposure to scientific literature because um, I put myself out there and did a lot of reading. And it's kind of like a subconscious process where if you read a lot, then it kind of like get used to the style they use. Um, and it just comes to you naturally more when you're actually writing your research paper. Um, these are the top ones that I would recommend, but there's a lot more. Um, so if you get the chance to do research at Stanford, another perk that they have is a lot of these you have to pay for if you do at home. They have like, um, you can read the abstract for free, but like in terms of the actual paper you have to pay money for and it's kind of expensive. But at Stanford, their internet allows you to access all these different databases for free. Um, so if you do work there, take advantage of that. Do a lot of reading at the university so you don't have to pay for that. Um, and another thing I think is really valuable in a research paper is besides your experiments and your analysis, something you want to include is um, actual stat statistics or statistical analysis because you want to make sure that your results actually are valid and they're statistically significant because just because you see visually something is according to your hypothesis like maybe this gene represses the cell proliferation and you see it visually um, that might not be significant so you need to learn how to do like different analyses um, about your data to make sure it's actually true and how I did this was I just took advantage of the resources that my school had. So I'm taking AP Stats this year, and um, at that time we didn't really learn much about the analysis because this application was earlier on in the semester. So I just asked my teacher, hey, can I come in during lunch? You can teach me more about what sort of analysis you use um, to analyze the data, like determining the p-value or doing independent t-tests or whatever. So just, like, I guess try to maximize your resources more. It ties into my theme in the beginning. Um, but try to use your teachers and resources that you have um, to benefit your research paper. Um, this is the general template if you want to write it down. You generally include an abstract, um, which is a one-page summary of your project, um, an introduction, which provides the background information, why it's significant, the methods and materials, your results, discussion, and conclusion feature work. Um, and I would pay attention to the discussion and conclusion feature work because it goes back to what I was saying about it's not necessarily your research, but how you present it and the whole idea of what is successful research. Because even if your experiments don't exactly correlate to your hypothesis, which is actually my case, um, you can 
in your discussion, you can, I guess, present it in a better light. And what I'm saying about this is, in my project, um, the gene I was talking about, P21, um, I thought it would like, it, it would be a necessary factor in repressing the stem cell proliferation, but it wasn't. It was only like a partial regulator. And if you think about it, like partial is not very conclusive. Like, like say, oh, this class is only partially going to help me raise my grade, or this experience is only partially helpful. Like, it's not very um, convincing to the audience. But the way that I was able to use it in my discussion was related to other research going on. So this gene has also been found in other research in like partially, prote partially protecting the cell from um, irradiation. So the fact that my results was tied into other background science literature made it more convincing and made my research a lot more credible. So I'm definitely not saying like, like skew your research in any way or fudge your data. That's not okay, but in your discussion, if you're able to find outside scientific literature that relates to your project and your results, it really adds credibility to it. Oh, and also future work, you want to have a clear idea of how you want to move forward with your research because these judges, again, they're looking at your potential as a scientist and if you have like future aspirations for yourself and how you want to continue the research, um, it's a lot more appealing. Okay. Um, before I go into part two um, about like a general advice about my high school experience, I'd just like to invite um, my parents to talk more, just a, like a few minutes about, um, <laughs> about like how they thought my science experience was and because I know like there's a lot of parents in this room, um, so how parents might be able to get involved, um, like assist their child with this whole process. So um, I'd like to invite my dad, Mr. Charles Kong, if we could give him a round of applause. Chinese? Mm -hmm. huh? Chinese is fine with us, actually. Oh, oh well, <laughs> since there's a lot of teenagers there, I, I think probably use uh, English better. Um, what I uh, really want to say is uh, what uh, Angela did in her research uh, is uh, <coughs> um, I, we have to give the, the, the credit to her uh, mentor. Um, without uh, her mentor, uh, it's Im almost impossible for her to achieve this. Um, and I, I think this uh, probably some of you already uh, read uh, um, some uh, news coverage. I think this is over, over praise, in, 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 at least in the Chinese media. So, and, and, and uh, she is just do something, you know, under the guidance of her mentor to identify a gene. It's not discovery or something. You know, the, the, the reason I say that is that <coughs> I would like to encourage all the parents. Uh, there's a lot of uh, potential for your kid because uh, um, Angela is uh, just an average, average kid. And she started research pretty late, as uh, she mentioned is uh, in the, uh, uh, the, the, the freshman, oh, not junior. freshman, junior, junior. So uh, it started pretty late. Um, and as a parent, we uh, encourage you her to to you know uh, get some research experience, and but in the beginning we didn't realize uh, how could a high school student could work together with uh, you know the professor, uh, postdoc, and do something really meaningful. We we, we think this is impossible, uh, but later on um, I I you know um, um, from her experience, I, I, I realized probably uh, my thinking is not, not, not right. Because uh, uh, look at the, the research world. They literally mean uh, repeat search. So that means it's, a, it's, a, uh, um, it's, it's look for something uh, without map. Because uh, you don't know what the, 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 the uh, research really come up. What you will find in your research. So it's just like you search something, you know, um, unlike, you know, you have a map, you want to go someplace, that's, that's basically repeat what the previous experience. But research is something, you know, you, 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 you find something you don't know. You don't have uh, any clue what will come up. So in that sense, probably 
uh, high school students, they might contribute some different angle to the research in the, in the, in the, uh, in the college level. So that's, a, um, that's what I understand. Um, so it's don't never uh, underestimate the potential of those uh, you know high school kid. They can you know if, if you encourage them to 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 explore, they can do something maybe surprise you. So uh, like Angela say, it's a sky is the limit. It's basically uh, it's our understanding too. So it's a, encourage your kid to uh, explore the potential. So um, that's the uh, that's the that's the point I want to make and encourage the uh, the audience, especially parents, to give whatever chance to your kids. It's, it's never too late. It's uh, um, you know, it's uh, um, especially in this area we have a, a lot of uh, um, opportunity. We have a lot of facility you can access. So. Um, I would say probably you know you can ask me some question if uh, if you like. You,呃，做做就不知道可以用中文说，就是作为家长，我我就觉得说你怎么能让小孩那么self yeah, I I I think everybody understands the question, right? Um to be honest with you, um we are pretty lucky. The Angela is a pretty uh, uh self motivated girl. So that's that's a fact. Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, they they they, uh, they might get some. I don't know. They might get some influence from from their parents. Okay. You know that. Uh, um, maybe it's better for her to answer this question. <laughs> 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 yeah, but you know, uh, my observation is uh, we we are lucky parents. So she is a very self uh, disciplined. And and and. Uh, we are in the position to provide the resource uh, to her when, when she, you know, she kind of, uh, uh, I, but often time I tell him, it, it's a horse, uh, <laughs> it's a horse pulling the, the car, it's not car pulling the horse, right? So you got to have a motivation to, to uh, uh, in the beginning to start with. So we, we, we don't want to push, you know, if she don't really like to do something, it, you force her to do it, probably it's not going to work. So, um, yeah. Then I can ask Angela's question. How did you find your, let's see, your deep interest in the, you know, you talk a little bit. I know, uh, I know a lot of kids may have good grades, right, on paper, but uh, they just don't have such interest or curiosity. Let me tell uh, us this. How do you when do you start to know uh, that you're actually interested in this type of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think that's a good question. And to be honest, like, I don't think there's a point where you actually know what you want to do or what you love. And even now, I don't really know what I want to be in the future. Um, but the way, the mindset I would advise you to approach everything is like, just like, give it a try because like my dad said the sky's the limit it's a cliche saying but it's really true and I feel like um, when you want to if you don't know what you want to do it's fine to experiment because like like why not and you have nothing really to lose and so much to gain from just trying out different things and I also think that in the process of doing things like for example for my research I didn't know if I liked research in the beginning I just like decided like I like science I didn't know if I liked doing research in the lab um, and like when I did it, it was, I, I, I found I really liked it. So you don't, there's not like a stage where you know, oh, I want to become a research scientist. I would just recommend having an open mind with everything you do and trying things out because like you might like it, you might hate it, but like that's life. <laughs> okay. I know you have the clubs in middle school. So were you in a 
Science Olympiad or Science Bowl or what? Um, in middle school, no. Um, but I think I, I kind of regret not doing that. I didn't really know about those opportunities. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't in, I think I was like in FBLA in my seventh grade year. But to be honest, I didn't like it when I was in middle school. So I just quit. Um, that was, I, I really liked it in high school. But mm-hmm. in middle school, I wasn't very involved. But I would, that's one thing I do regret, not being more involved with that. Okay, so, um, can we give a, one more round of applause to my dad? We pass good genes to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and to answer someone's question about, oh, your question about, like, um, like, what role my parents have played, I think to answer that effectively, I'd like to go back to hundreds of thousands of years ago um, because I, I don't I don't think a lot of people know but I'm like um, I'm the 75th descendant of Confucius and a lot of people don't know about this and it's not like like people it's not like a brag about it or anything but I really think that his values have kind of affected me and have been imparted to me because as you guys probably know Confucius has a lot of these different Luan Yu or analects um, that my parents and my, my grandparents have always tried to instill in me. So for example, like when I was small, my parents would kind of tell me like these cliche sayings like what you do not want for yourself, do not do unto others. Or I remember like memorizing like these vocab words in sixth grade and my dad would tell me like, um, he who learns but does not think is lost which is another one I'm sure you guys are familiar with. And at that time, as a kid, I was just pretty, I was like, like, what is the point of all these sayings? I just want to get an A on my vocabulary test. I don't want to think about this. Um, so at the time, I don't think I was like very appreciative of like all these sayings, but at the same time, like being always told these larger values, it kind of just stuck with me. And I think that as a parent, um, instead of being very tunnel, like, like, I guess, um, close-minded and just telling your kid to do this, do that. Um, instead, it's more helpful to provide a larger influence and just um, like emphasize the larger values and the bigger picture, which I'll be talking about more in the second part of my slide. Okay, so, okay, so the first thing I want to share is my experience from a shy girl to a leader, and I think it's applicable to a lot of um, young high school freshmen. Um, so number one advice I have for everyone is step out of your comfort zone um, because I feel like like when I entered high school I was or throughout elementary and middle school I was like I had a fear of raising my hand in class because I was just like what if I'm wrong I don't want to make a fool out of myself um, and that continued in high school I was very shy couldn't even raise my hand in class um, but what ended up happening is I joined this club called Future Business Leaders of America, and I think that that club is the one who like kind of changed who I was as a freshman into um, a more outspoken person, just because of the wide variety of opportunities it, ha- it has given me. Um, so I think that like freshman year is the time for you to try new things because like there the stakes are so low. There's nothing to lose. Like in high school, I mean in in the real world, you can't really do the same. You can't have the same mindset because you have to be worried about like earning enough money for your family, losing your job. You can't be as um, risk taking. But freshman year is really time, really a good time for you to try new things. And in FBLA, um, part of the reason why it helped me was because it was so large. And I think as students or parents, you might think, oh, I want to join a smaller club because I'll get more individualized attention and I can be like babysitted and like someone's gonna hold my hand throughout the way. Um, but FBLA, it's, there's like 200, over 200 different members. And what, when I joined, I felt like a small fish in this huge ocean, like very insignificant. Mm-hmm. But that pushed me to kind of make a name for myself and make myself noticed by other officers so like, I could do more. And um, in terms of like other good opportunities for that, I think Speech and Debate and Model United Nations, I wasn't a part of those, but these are also a good way for you to practice your public speaking. Um, And FBLA, going back to that club, one thing that changed me was joining the parliamentary procedure team um, because this is a team of five people and you don't know anyone before going in, Um, but there was like, there were two juniors in that club or that team and one senior who really sort of guided me along. Um, They're the ones who like trained my public speaking skills before I was a very awkward speaker and they taught me to use hand motions, Um, small things like that, that really helped me become a better public speaker. Um, and 
I remember that one experience that I had in my freshman year really made a difference for me. It was when I was chosen as the treasurer of this chapter project committee. And what happened, um, my parents probably remember this as well, was I had to fundraise the money or like the food necessary to feed like over 100 people at this hunger banquet. And if you think about like dinner for 100 people, that's a lot of food. Um, so I had to, I, and I did this by myself so what happened was I had to go and individually contact each restaurant manager um, write letters for them um, or like at first it was like phone calls and then it was letters and then I realized I had to go in person and it was very intimidating for me because I didn't like to talk to people I was like comfortable with my friends but I didn't want to talk to people I didn't know or like um, people who were like very high up in the business chain um, so that like experience pushed me to talk to other people and I feel like if like you get used to doing something for a long time it becomes a lot more natural so that was the experience that changed me um so something else that i would recommend like going forward is to find role models and mentors they were really instrumental to my growth um so in fbla i kind of looked at the seniors and the juniors who were in front of the classroom all the time presenting to us um because if you have someone who like you want to be and you really admire and you like then you have the motivation and inspiration to strive towards like who they are um, so really try to find someone who you admire so you can have that motivation um, and also like public speaking workshops and classes I'm pretty thankful to my parents who sent me to a public speaking class when I was um, in elementary school I think <laughs> which is a long time ago but um, I think that was like it I think FBLA, of course, played a larger role, but public speaking workshops are also like a small environment to develop my speaking skills. Um, so I guess as a general advice, like really step out of your comfort zone. Um, like if you imagine, I was like this shy girl, and I guess like if you imagine me in this small circle, like I was very shy, I didn't, like there was no opportunities that I could take advantage of because I was so shy. Um, but then if you continue like widening and stepping out of your comfort zone, you're in this much larger circle of opportunities that you can take advantage of. And um, that's how you can maximize your high school experience. I, I still remember uh, when, when I uh, sent her to school in the elementary school uh, year, every morning, I asked her the same question over and over repeatedly. Uh, have you raised your hand in, 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 uh, today? Or have you raised, raised your hand? Will you raise your hand to, uh, today? So uh, I think the repeat uh, reinforce this. Uh, uh, by nature, probably she's not a good, uh, good public speaker, or you know she's a, a shy girl. But once you, if you encourage her, you know repeatedly, she will become what you're looking for. And to be honest, at that time, I found that very annoying, but I think it was <laughs> Yeah, I still remember that time when like, you told me, and then we were really at school, and I just like, pretended I didn't hear, and like, left, so we didn't have to answer. <laughs> but yeah, that's, I think that's, that was helpful. Um, and then in terms of like, extracurriculars and time management, um, like, this is more related to the college admissions process, but I feel like, like you can do a lot of things, but just keep in mind that grades are still number one, because if you're looking for to go to like a top university, um, I think grades are, um, like to give you an analogy, it's like if you want to win the lottery, like you have to buy a lottery ticket first in order to win. Without a lottery ticket, you just have no chance. So it's kind of like if you want to go to a very top school, I'm um, talking about like Ivy League, you want to have that ticket so gr and grades are like that ticket that you have to maintain and on top of that that's where you can build on your extracurriculars but um, just keep in mind that grades are important um, number two this is also for parents but I think that it's really important to let your child do what he or she likes not just what you think will be um, beneficial to the college admissions process because um, more than anything else if you don't like what you do you get really depressed and burnt out and you don't want your child to be unhappy by forcing them to do what they don't want to do and high school is like supposed to be a time for you to experiment new things and try out new things so you shouldn't try to confine your child um, learn to prioritize and let things go I think that's um, kind of hard for everyone to do because as humans we want to like do more things always we want to have more um, to be more successful but at a certain time you have to learn to like prioritize and like kind of analyze what things are important to you and be able to let things go um, so actually um, I see a few dance team members in this 
room. I used to be part of dance team as well. Um, I don't think what I have to say like is like bashing on dance team at all. It was just a personal thing for me. Um, but what I found with dance team, I really like dancing, but um, for me, I just found that um, the time that I put into the team wasn't, for me personally, it wasn't like a valuable um, or an experiment, an experience that I felt I could get the most out of with the time that I had. Um, so while I do like, I, I miss that, I miss dancing with them a lot. I felt that like the team, um, even though a lot of people told me, hey, you already did it for two years, freshman, sophomore year, you have to continue. So because colleges like it when you show persistence and dedication um, or like people were very against me trying to quit because they're like, it's not um, it's generally frowned upon. Um, for me, I just didn't feel like it was rewarding and that's why I did it. So I guess the general advice is even if you if you feel like you should be, you're only doing it for the sake of continuing it so it looks good on colleges, don't do that. But if you like truly enjoy that experience with the team, then definitely continue. Um, and I guess also something that I regret that um, I'd like to share is in my junior year, I think everyone kind of perceives junior year as like the year of the most intense academic experience, grades matter the most, colleges look at that year the most, it's very difficult. And I came into junior year with that same experience, same mindset. Um, and I think like after I didn't do dance team anymore, like I still really like dancing to this day, but in junior year, I felt like I had to let like not just dance team go, but just the general experience of dancing because I needed to focus on academics. And I regret doing that because I was, I wasn't very happy at that time because I wasn't doing something that I like to do. Um, so I feel like even if it's very hard to like, do your, your, your classes are very hard, um, you need to still balance what you like to do with what you have to do because or else you're just gonna become very unhappy. And I think also like, so I realized this in my second semester junior year when I started taking classes at my local studio and Chinese dance classes again. Um, it made me a lot more happier and it also just like helped me with my academics also in the sense that I was more focused if I had, if I got a chance to do what I like to do. Um, so that's one thing that I did regret. So if you, if you like something, don't let it go just because of like, like school or something like that because you won't be happy. Um, and last thing I wanted to say about prioritizing and let things go is um, there's like a difference between like thinking the process through before you let go of something and quitting because you think it's too hard. So just make sure before you decide to like let anything go, like you're really discussing it with your parents, your friends. Don't make it like an overnight decision. Like think through it for like um, at least a month before you do it because some things you like it's it seems like it's just like too hard but um you have to realize like there's a difference between too being too hard or actually not being like what you like to do and like for example research is like really frustrating and really um it's difficult and it's not exactly what you would call like fun to do but that's i, I found it very valuable and that's why i continue to do it um, and in terms of time management, um, what I like to do is 